So our P53 story starts with an observation that Moshe Oren made in the early 90s. He observed that if you overexpress, transiently express, a fragment of P53 in cells, which cannot go to the nucleus and which does not contain a DNA binding domain, it kills the cells by apoptosis. This was a puzzle that in intrigued me for years. Several years later, more 10 years later, working with Jerry Chipick, at that time in San Diego, and subsequently in Memphis at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, we investigated how fragments of P53, or cytosolic P53 that is not engaging nuclear transcription, might induce apoptosis. What Jerry observed, along with Martin Schuler in the lab, was that cytosolic P53, uh, we should start again. So our P53 story begins in the early 90s with an observation that Moshe Oren made. He observed that a fragment of P53 expressed in cells that didn't have the ability to engage transcription, lacking a DNA binding domain, or go to the nucleus, lacking a nuclear localization sequence, nevertheless induced apoptosis in cells. This intrigued me for years, and about 10 years later, working first with Martin Schuler and then with Jerry Chipick, we explored how cytosolic P53 can induce the mitochondrial pathway of apoptosis. Jerry observed that activation of P53, stabilization of P53 in the cytosol, would activate the proapoptotic protein BAX to permeabilize mitochondria and release cytochrome C to engage apoptosis. This was really unusual because up until then we'd only known one type of protein that could activate the pro-apoptotic effectors, BAX and BAC, the BH3 only protein such as BID and BIM. But P53 was able to do this as well. Somehow that wasn't really observed in cells. It was we could we could induce it, we could observe this, but clearly P53 performs a transcriptional activity. And the following year, Jerry had shown that the transcriptional activity of P53 to induce PUMA would disrupt in the cytosol a complex of BCLXL and P53, releasing the P53 to activate BAX and engage apoptosis in the cytosol. So now we had a connection between the transcriptional roles and the non-transcriptional roles of P53 through the interaction of PUMA. In 2005, I moved to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, and first working with Jerry Chipick, and then with Fabian Lamby, together with the laboratory of Richard Kowacki, a structural biologist, and his postdoc, Ariel Folis, we investigated the structural biology of these phenomena. And what Ariel and Richard was able, were able to show was that P53 and BCLXL form a complex that's specifically disrupted by PUMA, and we could understand this at the structural level. More recently, investigating the interaction of P53 with BAX at the structural level, we could begin to understand how P53 activates BAX, interacting at a non-canonical site in BAX to induce the conformational changes that activate BAX. Intriguingly, the P53 that was in that complex had undergone a conformational change. Two of the prolines in the proline-rich region were isomerized. We knew an enzyme that could do that, PIN1. So most recently, we were able to show that PIN1 induces a conformational change in cytosolic P53, which now confers its ability to bind to Bax and induce its activation. We still don't know if this is important for the function of P53, but the notion is, it seems to be. We can understand this at the structural level and biochemically. We can sh demonstrate this in the absence of any other proteins. But the challenge before us now is to find out when is this important in the biological activity of P53 and how does it suppress tumor genesis. Aloha. Here I, here I am in Anchorage, Alaska. It's really cold outside. It's unbelievable. I'm not dressed for this weather.